But I grew up, as, as uh, people have said over these past couple of days, in Gast down the road in Gastonia, down, down 85 in Gastonia. Some of you may know where that is. The room is kind of quiet. None of you are trying to sneak out, so maybe you don't know much about Gastonia. But it's kind of a place that doesn't have the greatest reputation uh, for a number of reasons. I was there doing some research at the public library, and I'll talk about that in a little bit for, for this dark road to mercy, which is set, you know, for those of you who have read it, in Gastonia. And I was asking one of the reference librarians about a particular thing that happened in Gastonia. And I'd always grown up hearing that Gastonia was dangerous, but you always you know, hear people talk about things like that. This librarian said, oh, what you're looking for, that might be in our murder file. <laughs> and I was like, oh, the public library has a murder file. And I went back in the special collections room, and there was a big file cabinet that just said murder. <laughs> and it just had years on it. And some years were thicker than others. It's like, man, a lot of murdering going on in 1981, apparently. And I started thinking about these two young girls that I knew growing up in Gastonia. They went to my church. They were 15 and 12, and I was 15 at the time. And they were being raised by a foster family, this older couple at my church. And when they were 15 and 12, the girls went to live with their birth mother. And they ended up being murdered by two guys they were dating. The 12-year-old's boyfriend was in his 20s. Uh, I'm sorry, the 15-year-old's boyfriend was in his 20s, and the 12-year-old's boyfriend was in his 30s. And these guys picked them up at their mother's house one night, accused the girls of stealing money from them, uh, violently killed them, tried to hide their bodies, and they, they were called immediately. That, that's the research I was doing at the library when she showed me the murder file. I was researching the, the, the tragedy of these girls. And they were 15 and 12 when this happened, and I was 15 when this happened. This was the first person I'd ever known who died, much less who had been murdered, right? And these were girls who were born into a certain set of circumstances whose lives almost could not have ended up any other way. You know, when we think of writers, we think of the person who, like, goes to Starbucks uh, with the beret cocked to one side and a leather-bound journal and a huge quill pen who, like, gets it out and wants everyone to know that they're a writer. And, like, if you want to see a writer, you have to, like, break into someone's house in the middle of the night to see him sitting in front of his desk with a blank screen and just weeping, full of self-doubt. That's a writer. It's not the person who, like, has on too much cologne in the coffee shop trying to get girls to look at him because he's carrying a $40 journal from Barnes & Noble. It's not, that's not necessarily what a writer is. And I think so often we see writing as this very mysterious, very intangible, unapproachable thing that we can't do or we could never do or we'll say things like, uh, people say these kinds of things to me a lot. I'd write a book too if I had the kind of time you have. Um, so writing is not this unapproachable, impossible, romantic thing where you have to be Ernest Hemingway or you know somebody off in a tower somewhere. But it's also not this very flippant thing where it's like, yeah, when I'm retired, I'm going to write a novel every six months. You know, it's not, it's not that either. It's, it's, it's work. It's just like anything that you want to be good at, you just do it. And if you want to do it bad enough, you won't watch three hours of Real Housewives of Orange County, right? If you want to write a book, turn off the TV, sorry. Turn off the PlayStation or whatever you're playing or, you know, don't go out so much. Don't, you know, spend so much time doing things that are ultimately going to make you a worse person, like watching Real Housewives of whatever county, you know. Um, but, you know, you have, to make, you have to make sacrifices and you have to approach everything you want to do with a certain amount of dedication. If you want to be a really, really good basketball player, you have to play a lot of basketball. I set this at the school that I went to, 
Robinson Elementary in, in, in Gastonia, where I, where I went to school. And this is the ball field that I grew up playing ball on. And, and it's the school that I grew up attending. So when, when Pruitt goes to the cafeteria, that's my cafeteria at Robinson Elementary. I went back kind of to the scene of the crime, literally, to, to remind myself of what that place looked like. As a matter of fact, I was back there two summers ago uh, doing the commencement address in my high school. And uh, my wife, we drove down from West Virginia, and she went on, she dropped me off in Gastonia and went on down to Columbia, South Carolina for a friend's birthday. And I was going to rent a car and drive down to Columbia to meet her. And she dropped me off at the car rental place. And the guy was like, man, the car you ordered, we don't have it. This is in Gastonia, keep in mind. What we do have, you're going to love. I was like, oh Lord, what is it? It was a turquoise Camaro. I'm wearing a suit, I'm going back to my high school to deliver the commencement address, and a turquoise Camaro with like New Jersey plates or something like that. He's like, I drive it home sometimes at night just to drive it. I'm like, is that against the rules? He's like, so I'm in my turquoise Camaro. And I'm driving around town with a little time to kill before I have to go deliver the commencement address. And I drive past my old elementary school. It's a Saturday morning, 10 a.m. I'm like, I'm going to go back to Robinson and just kind of walk around outside. It's summer. There's nobody there. So I park and I get out and I'm walking around. I'm like, gosh, so little of this has changed. This still feels the same to me. And I walk past the gymnasium and I, I think, Gosh, I remember when they built this gymnasium, and I remember how it smelled. It, it smelled the same for years, and, and smell is our best sense of memory. And I was curious to know what it smelled like. So I tried the door, and it was unlocked. And I'm happy to report the gymnasium at Robinson Elementary smells the same as it did when I was in elementary school. I'm also happy to report that the alarm system is in very good working order at Robinson Elementary. And so while I was in the gym, I was like, what's that noise? And I went outside, and there was a deafening siren going off. And my first thought was run. <laughs> like, just run. Get in your turquoise Camaro with the New Jersey plates and just peel out, right? And then my second thought was, you're gonna be, if you run, you're going to jail. I'm going to jail if I run. And so I just, I just called 911 and said, um, hi, I set off the alarm at Robinson Elementary. And he's like, how'd you set it off? And he said, we got a signal, you know, that the alarm company called us. How'd you set it off? And I said, well, I'm here uh, to deliver the commencement address at my, my high school. He's like, this is an elementary school. Why are you there? And he said, do you have a child in school? And I said, no, sir, I don't even live here, as a matter of fact. I'm just in town for a short time. And by the end of it, he was like laughing. He was like, this is the worst story I've ever heard. And he's like, I'll call the police and let them know, you know, not to arrest you when they get there. As I'm going back to my car, the cop pulls up. I have to give him my same story. He's like looking at my plate. He's like, I see your registration. I'm like, this was a rental. Sorry. It's like, can I look in the trunk? And I was like, I guess, but I haven't looked at it. I don't know what's in there, so I hope nothing bad, you know? I hope nothing bad from the previous winter. And it ended up letting me go. And as I was leaving the parking lot, my wife called. She was like, good luck at your speech. What's that noise? And I was like, that's the alarm. She was like, at what? I was like, I set off the alarm in my elementary school. She was like, I'm going to let you go. She just didn't even ask. She was not even like, what happened? She was like, I, I'll just see you tonight when you get here. You can, 